But the nice thing is, is we've effectively covered all of the information that's going to be on your first exam from chapters uh, effectively one, two, and three. So now, uh, effectively, this week is a review. So we can review on however much material you guys want to review upon. And from there, you guys can ask whatever questions. Uh, if you want to know what's going to be on the exam, uh, when in doubt, the study guide that I've got up there is a really good start uh, place to start. It's going to have a lot of the basic types of questions we're going to cover. Sorry, my sinuses are living the dream this morning. Oh. So, but such is the life sometimes. So what questions do you guys want me to go ahead and try and, oh, cool. Somebody's put something up in the chat. And, oh, cool. Yeah, so what do you guys want to go ahead and work on? What do you guys want to talk about? You guys can go ahead and write in the chat a type of question you'd like to go ahead and break down. You guys can go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and go ahead and ask a question. What do you guys, what do you guys feeling? See, uh, we did have a question uh, about the project, the Lab One project. Yeah, what's up, Luke? Uh, yeah, it was the um, the lower part of that. Um, we were talking in our in the deadlift group, trying to figure it all out. We managed to get the first part, but then the second part uh, regarding the specific exercise, mm -hmm. we were having a little bit of trouble figuring out. Would there be any way you could maybe elaborate on on that part? Yeah, no worries, actually. Let's go ahead and give me one moment and I will pull up a happy video of somebody deadlifting. Okay. Um, anybody in particular you guys want to see deadlift? You know what? We'll see if this video is still up there. Okay. So. Okay, apologize for the gratuitous location, but it is going to be useful for you guys to kind of see what's going on. I don't know what the volume is going to be like on this, so this could be intense and I'm sorry. But effectively, this would be the beginning of the movement. So this would be effectively the kind of the start position and then wind up and that's going to be their hips in the bottom position. So you look at how the angles changed in the hips, in the knees, in the back, uh, potentially even in the shoulders. So then, from there, and we'll go ahead and bring the speed down. Sorry, I gotta move some things around on here. We'll move the speed to, that was a dumb place to put the camera. Um, go about half speed. Not that anybody's that fast with deadlifting. So then they're gonna go ahead and lock out. So that's gonna be the finished position. So you've got the changes again in the ankles, knees, hips, shoulders, and back. And then, they're going to go ahead and get the down call and then set the weight down. And so that'd be the, essentially the follow through or otherwise. So you'd be looking at the changes in angles in each of those positions. Now that right there is what's known as a sumo style deadlift. So, oh yeah, Danny pulled sumo. Ah, freaking Sam Bird. This dude's insane. He, uh, he tore his hamstrings on the squat for this day. And then he came back and hit this pretty much straight legged. Yeah, and so you can see it's really it's just pretty much hips, knees, ankles, and you can see still the angles on the shoulders. So does that make sense of kind of how you break it down of, you know, the start position? This guy kind of grunted above, so that's why you get the weird noises. Yep. 
You see a little bit of the asymmetry and how he's pulling the movement through and then doing it. Eh, Eddie Hall's okay, but I'm not too impressed with him body weight relative. Uh, this is Greg Duquette. He's a guy that ended up winning the weight class. Yeah, I opened the 628. So, and you can actually, you know, same thing. You can see the, actually the shoulder rotation on the start position. Probably should have tried to be back a little bit more on the pole, but, you know, he still had pretty solid numbers. And then because I'm kind of vain, that's me. Uh, yeah, 644 is what I opened with with that competition. And that was a 181. So yay for lifting back in the day. So does that kind of give you guys some ideas? Oh, Jeremy Hamilton, this guy was pretty awesome. Yeah, opens with a 700 pound deadlift. Nothing, nothing too crazy. Yeah, Jay Nair is one of the scarier guys that I met during that period of time, but he's a super nice guy. Just crazy, crazy strong. All right, so what other questions can I help you guys with? Awesome. Could you do one of the questions that asks about vertical force vectors or horizontal force vectors? So let's, we'll do a couple and we'll do a simple one to start. So the first one we're going to do, and this is going to be, notice guys over here, the trig where we're talking about the Sokotoa. Okay. If you effectively are trying to push off. So if you've got somebody that's trying to run and the body would be up here, you're going to be pushing into the ground in a 45 degree angle, which means you're going to have both a horizontal component and a vertical component. Okay. And the ground's pushing back into you with that same amount of force and that equal and opposite reaction. So what we would then do, don't worry guys, I'm going to change it into so you can see this camera a little bit better, but I wanted you guys to kind of be able to look at and write down the trick parts we're using. We'll bring up the equation slide on your computer. So, Oh my gosh, my marker sucks again, doesn't it, guys? So this right here is going to be a 45 degree, degree angle. You're going to push with, let's say, a grand total of 500 newtons of force. So from there, we're going to want to break this into both the horizontal and the vertical amount of force. Okay, so the way that we're going to break it down into those different force vectors is we need to figure out using our trig what each of those vectors are. Now, I'm going to go try to find a better marker, but the goal here is it's a 45 degree angle, okay, and you're producing 500 newtons of force. I'll be right back.
Okay. And my markers are that great, but we'll see what works. Okay, guys. So we're going to then go ahead and start breaking this down by doing our good old trig. So we know the sine of the angle, which is 45, equals the opposite. Okay, so that's going to be our vertical component. over 500. So then, if we multiply both sides by 500, we can end up with 500 times the sine of 45 is going to equal the opposite, which is going to equal our vertical, okay? Now, our horizontal, we're going to use cosine. So it's gonna be the same basic idea of cosine of 45 equals our adjacent over 500 newtons times both sides by 500 newtons. And then that's going to give us our horizontal force. Let me know what you guys came up or if you guys are still with me and you got through those answers. And go ahead and just put up in the chat what you come up with. Because since we're at a 45 degree angle, both of those force vectors are going to be the exact same number since it happens to be equal. <laughs> nice job, guys. Because uh, the sine of 45 is about 0 0.72, right? So you just take that, you know, 0 0.72, multiply that by 500, and you get 353 newtons. Okay, now that's how we can convert, obviously, from having our force vectors into the individual ones. To go backwards, we would just flip things over. So let's say if our horizontal force vector was 500 newtons and we knew the angle was 45, you would then, instead of putting it the 500 underneath, you would put the 500 on top. So for the horizontal, we'd be talking about the cosine. And from there, we would have the, well, let's just, I'll draw up another one. If we know that we have, this is what we're trying to solve for, we know this is 500 newtons, we know it happens to be a 45 degree angle. So in turn, we're gonna have cosine 45 equals 500 newtons over the hypotenuse. So we're gonna multiply both sides by the hypotenuse, which, gives us the hypotenuse times cosine equals 40 or equals 500 newtons. So then what we'll do is divide both sides by 45, cosine 45. So that gives us a final equation of our hypotenuse equals 500 newtons over cosine 45 degrees. Yeah, that's still not really coming through super clear for you guys, is it? <laughs> I 
Okay, thanks, Zach. So, uh, Catherine, I think is the one that kicked us off. Do you feel a bit better about the vest, uh, the horizontal and vertical force vector questions now? Oh, sorry, Haley. Okay, now let's go ahead and take it one step further, okay? So we're gonna do both a friction problem and we're going to do a uh, acceleration problem. So let's do the acceleration problem first, where we know force equals mass times acceleration, okay? If we are having you produce and we'll go back to this one where we solved where it's about 352, I think was the answer. If we have 352 newtons of force that we're putting into the ground horizontally, okay? So that's gonna be propelling you forward. That's the force side. The mass side is gonna be your body weight, okay? So, I want you to go ahead and enter your own body weight here. Now, from there, we are going to be able to determine what our acceleration is. So you're gonna know force, so you're gonna end up with the final equation of force over mass equals your acceleration. So this number should be about 352. We'll just round it to make it easier. Your mass is your own personal body weight. So what's your acceleration? And then I want you guys to put up in the chat what your acceleration is gonna be. Kilograms for your mask, Cass. Kilograms for your mask, or for your mass. Okay, remember, mass in kilograms, you're gonna take your body weight and divide that by 2.2. So, looks like Braden is our lowest acceleration so far. Yeah, so I weigh about 95 kilos. So if you take the 352 divided by about 95 kilos, you're gonna end up with my acceleration would be about 3.6, 3.7. Brayden, it's okay, bud. You guys are here to learn. Brayden, you feel better about your answer now? Does it seem a little more consistent? Okay. Okay. Yeah, these numbers are looking a little bit more realistic. Okay, okay. Now, here's the interesting thing for what all of you guys might not, it might not obviously be that intuitive yet, you guys are still learning, but notice how, go figure, if we're only able to produce a finite amount of force, okay, so that's, that's peak force, that's all we can do is the people, and obviously I know you guys can't see each other, um, so I weigh about 210 to 215, depends on the day, um, and how much I'm eating my feelings and how they don't have to be calorie, calorie free. The bigger you are, the lower your acceleration is going to be because of that 
force is maxed out and it's always going to be limited by the mass. So literally, by understanding this formula, the force equals mass times acceleration, you literally understand the reason why, if you fully understand it, like as in conceptually in an application, of why you need to lift weights if you're working with an athlete. Because we can either increase the total amount of force we can produce, which is going to allow us to accelerate faster, or we can maybe try to decrease body weight, hopefully through intelligent means, to where we're going to maintain our force output, but we're gonna decrease that body mass, so once again, we're going to be accelerating faster. Because let's face it, if you're working with an athlete that's already very lean, you know, or just small in the first place, you can't really cut off more weight because you're going to be removing contractile mass. So if anything, we want to increase their potential to develop force, which is going to make them a better athlete. Or if you happen to be working with a very large person, um, talking about, you know, obesity and otherwise by legitimate body fat metrics, by decreasing that fat mass, you're again going to make them faster. But certain sports, you don't want to do that because they need to have a certain amount of mass in order to be a good athlete in their sport. So understanding this formula is literally the basics of who's gonna be the fastest off the line is literally the athlete that happens to have the best force to mass ratio. Now, here's the other thing. And this is the vertical component and this is why we need to think about this. Me standing right here, gravity is pulling me down at that 9.81 meters per second squared. So literally, just to stay standing, just to hold my position right here, I have to push down into the ground with 95 kilos multiplied by 9.81, which turns out to being almost 900 Newtons of force vertically. So if I was to push off with the only 500 Newtons of force in a 45 degree angle, yeah, I would accelerate my body forward, but I would also fall down because I wouldn't be producing as much force vertically as is pulling me downwards. Now for you guys, when you're looking at this number, okay, some of you folks are small enough that you actually could use produce that much force on the start and be fine. But like obviously the example with myself, that's not in the realm of feasibility because I'm a bit too much of a plus size model for that. Now, here's the other component that I want us to go and talk about, which is let's do a friction problem with it, okay? If you're pushing you know, backwards with that amount of force, okay? but where you're, it's the normal force, so it's gonna be the vertical force, which we're gonna still say is 352 Newtons, okay? How high does the coefficient of friction need to be so that you do not effectively slide when you're pushing into the ground? Someone, please ask a question over how we should start and set this up. Yeah, John, definitely make a force diagram. Now, remember, with friction,
Notice guys, we have the coefficient of friction times the normal force, okay? So if you're pushing off in the hard angle, okay, you're gonna have both that downward force and that force going backwards. We've already determined this force is 352 newtons from the initial example. And our vertical force is also gonna be 352 newtons. Now, as we are going to be obviously pushing backwards and downwards, we have to have a certain coefficient of friction that's going to allow us to keep our traction as we're pushing. Now, in this example, notice coefficient of friction times our normal force equals the total frictional force. So we would have to, in this example, at least have a coefficient of friction between these two surfaces of one. Otherwise, we'd slide. But this isn't counting for the body mass of our cells. So instead, your friction force, okay, so good old friction, that's the 352. The normal force is your body weight times the acceleration of gravity, which we're using 9.1, multiplied by the coefficient of friction. And that coefficient of friction is what we're trying to solve for. So we would divide this friction force by the normal force, and that's gonna give us the coefficient of friction. So this is we're please. gonna have our own. Go ahead, Catherine. Could you make your screen bigger, please? Yeah, no worries. I'm going to stop the share. So now we've gone through the formula. Okay. So friction equals the normal force times the coefficient of friction. So that friction force we're applying is 352. So we need to be effectively equal to that force or less than in order to keep ourselves from sliding due to the force of friction. So that's going to equal our normal force, which is your own body weight multiplied by that 9.81 multiplied by the coefficient of friction. So then we're gonna divide both sides by the normal force. So that way we're going to effectively eliminate that normal force. So we have friction divided by normal force equals our coefficient of friction. And that's the coefficient of friction that you need to have in order to keep yourself from sliding. So go ahead guys, work your way through the number and write in whatever you figure out. And in this example, obviously, your coefficient of friction is going to be way less than one. Point five three. That looks realistic. Nice. Your first exam is going to be next week. And when in doubt, guys, on Blackboard, you'll see the coming up because I've got all the dates and time set up for when you need to be taking these things. So notice again with this type of situation, guys, of putting a finite amount of force into the ground, the smallest individuals in the class are going to be requiring 
the greatest amount of friction and the largest people in the class are going to need the least amount of friction between the two surfaces to keep from falling over. Now, this is simply mathematically showing what you guys have already empirically probably experienced more than once in your life, which is how many of you guys have slipped on the shower floor, have slipped walking on a patch of ice. What really happened there, guys, is the amount of force you're putting horizontally into the ground was greater than what that normal force and coefficient of friction would allow, and hence your foot slid out from underneath you. It's just a math problem. I was looking at one of the exam review questions, and yeah. can we do one about uh, the coefficient of restitution? And this is what looks like a ball's bouncing. Yeah. And a coefficient of restitution problem, please. Of course. So coefficient of restitution, guys, is where if you drop a ball, okay, it's going to bounce accordingly to its coefficient of friction or coefficient of restitution. Meaning, if it has a coefficient of restitution of one, which effectively doesn't exist, it means every time you dropped the ball, it would fall, bounce, and hit the same height it did the first time each time. That's coefficient of restitution. Okay? So, if an object had a coefficient of restitution of 0.5, that means where you dropped it from, it would go down, bounce up to half its initial height, go down, bounce up to half of that height, go down, half of that height, go down, and go half of that height. So we care about coefficient of restitution because it's obviously, it's a big deal in any sport. So if you just drop a basketball from, we're gonna say two meters off the ground because it's gonna be in meters, Okay, and its coefficient of restitution is 0.75, okay? So we're gonna start at two meters off the ground and have a coefficient of restitution of 0.75, okay? From there, what would be its height for its first bounce, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and we'll, we'll go all the way to the eighth. So, you're going to take two meters times 0.75, because that's going to be the first bounce. How high is that bounce going to be off the ground? You want to throw that up in the chat, or you can unmute yourself. Awesome. Exactly, guys, one and a half meters. So then, this 1.5 meters is going to only bounce to 0.75 of its initial height. So now it's 1.5 times 0.75, which is going to be, uh, was that 1.175? One point one two five. Got to get this brain back in shape. Is that what the rest of you guys are coming up with? Awesome. So then, one point one two five times point seven five. How high is it going to bounce? Point eight four. Okay. 
I don't really like the rounding there, but you know, we'll go with it, we'll go with it. So then on the next bounce, thank you, Luke. Significant figures matter, folks. So next one should be 0.633. Uh, you guys aren't lying to me? What did you guys come up with? Ah, so 0.633 and then 0.47 from Cass. Nice guys, two more. And then finally, last but not least, About two, and then, oh, there we go. Point. So you can see how those bounces would keep getting lower and lower and lower and lower. It's perfectly normal. That's just how things are gonna go through thanks to coefficient of restitution. Now, like I said, in reality, your coefficient of restitution is gonna be somewhere between year, uh, zero and maybe like 0.99 nine if we're talking about like one of those rubber super balls you would have dropped as a kid that obviously bounces very high but instead we're going to go ahead and flip it on the other side and just throw out some crazy nonsense because it's fun and you need to remember sometimes you got to do science not because it's rational but because it's fun so We're going to drop the ball that's one meter. And it's some type of special ball that every time it bounces, it doubles its height. So its coefficient of restitution is two. So after the first bounce, it's gonna be at two meters. Then it's gonna be at four, then it's gonna be at eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, five, uh, 12, 10, 24, 2048, 4096, and then we'll take it all the way up to a grand total of 8,192. And I mean, we, we could keep going. Do you guys want to keep going? Just want to keep going? Anybody? No? Thank you, Rowan. Okay. Now, why did I just do something like that? Other than it's comical. Two reasons. One, because it's comical. The two is because this actually helps you guys understand what's known as exponential gain. Now, what we're really looking at here, guys, is not just a, a way of mathematically going through a crazy example, but also something that's very important to understand. Because we as humans are really, really bad at understanding exponential gain because you don't really ever see it in the environment or in the world outside of things that go beyond an individual person's experience. So 
exponential gain exists in things like interest rates, in things like disease rates in highly communicable diseases during pandemics. So therein lies the issue with what is known as the doubling time. So this example here of how we go from one to two, two to four, four to eight, eight to 16, 16 to 32, 32 to 64, and all the way on up. Now, this is a good thing if you're talking about money in your retirement. And so if the money that you're investing and in trying to one day retire on doubles every effective year, well, I mean, you're gonna be a very, very wealthy person because notice guys, this is only the doublings for 14 years. But if you have a disease that's even more communicable than COVID or potentially COVID without going and doing any types of restrictions, then you can literally go over the course of two weeks from only having on day one, two people infected to now 16,000, over 16,000 people infected in two weeks. And that's based on doubling time. Some things double even faster than that. And another interesting and kind of existential thought to think about, which is carrying capacity, which is uh, the example that I was taught back in the day that's obviously stayed with me and I thought was very fascinating, which is if there's bacteria on a dish and the bacteria doubles in size every two hours, effectively, in order for it to be filled up completely, and we're gonna work our way back so the dish cannot support any more bacteria, they've colonized the entire thing and they'll deplete the resources and they'll essentially all die very quickly uh, because they don't have enough to maintain themselves. Well, if the full carrying capacity is the 16,384, that means if we go back in time one double, where we've filled the plate halfway. We literally have the entire half still completely empty. So why should we be concerned about overfilling the plate if we are those bacteria? Much less we go back one more, we're only filling up a quarter of the plate. Who cares if we keep expanding? We've got plenty of space, we're only filling up a quarter of it. We're only filling up an eighth, we're only filling up a 16th, a 32nd, a 64th, and then the 128 hits it again. So that's what's really important with understanding exponential gain because it turns out when it's working against us because we're not managing resources, we're not doing any things that are intelligent and safe and helping out other individuals, it's very easy to make overestimations of how much is available and or how bad a disease is of using things like, how many of you guys going through this pandemic, please stop me with another question you guys want to talk about for biomechanics, but I do want to take the time to help you guys use math to further understand things of how many people have brought up the argument to you of like, well, do you know anybody that's had the disease? And that's a flawed argument because that's based upon your own individual observations and what you have happened to experience. It'd be the equivalent in the probably early 80s, late 70s, saying, well, do you really know anybody that's died of HIV, AIDS? Or in what would be like, you know, the middle of the dark ages, do you really know anybody who's had the bubonic plague? Because the disease isn't over, it's just starting. And the timelines are things we need to be careful of because if we allow it to just have exponential gain, it's gonna go through that population a lot faster. So, you know, math, is hard and it requires obviously a certain amount of practice like everything else in life to get good at it but it's important to think through like okay i mean yeah for you guys think about it on the other side of speaking about retiring for you guys that are probably around 20 if the money that you invest literally today and let's say you can somehow put together a thousand dollars and you put that in some type of account that doubles instead of being like every year because holy crap that would be amazing returns and i apologize for swearing but if that money literally doubled let's say every uh five no we'll go every eight years we'll do something that's still a pretty great returns but more reasonable 
that means if you didn't touch that money until you were say 65, 70, so you've got 50 years and it's gonna double every eight. So you're literally talking about, you're gonna have six and a half doublings. So literally that initial amount, that $1,000 is gonna be worth, worth over 64 grand whenever you retire. And that's if you never touch it and never add another dollar to it because of exponential return. And that's where, like I said, we're not good at thinking through these things. Like I look at this and I'm like, ah, yeah, these numbers make sense. But then at the end of the month, it's like, do I really want to try to put away more money on retirement or do I want to spend more money on protein powder? Hmm. And well, you win some and you lose some guys. You win some guys. So what other questions would you guys like to work on the review? Okay. Okay, cool. So one of the questions of the review is how much force do you need to create to move a block with a static friction of 0.9 and a dynamic friction of 0.8 and it weighs 800 newtons. Okay, this one is what we've already done, only it's gonna be even simpler. Okay, so notice guys, and thank you Haley, what is the difference between in moving the block and keeping it moving? In order to move the block, which of the two frictions do we need to use? Static. In order to move the block, you're taking an object that's sitting still and now you're moving it. In order to keep it moving, that's dynamic friction. And remember guys, your dynamic friction is always going to be lower than the other. So our friction, this is what we're trying to solve for. We are going to have the normal force, which is going to be 800 newtons. We're going to multiply that by our coefficient of friction for the static position, which in this example I gave you guys was 0.9. So in order to get this block moving, we're going to need to produce at least 720 newtons of force. However, if we already have the block moving, instead of using that 0.9, we're gonna use that 0.8. So it's gonna be the same basic formula, only we're going to be plugging in 0.8. So 800 Newtons times 0.8 for the dynamic friction, which is gonna give us a grand total of 640 Newtons of force is at least required in order to get that block to slide or to keep it sliding, keep it sliding. Hey, no worries guys. Sometimes you just gotta see it kind of put together. All of these are obviously concepts and these are things you've already observed in your own life like you've seen this happen, like you've seen a ball go through the air, it's rise and fall. All we're doing is adding values to these things that are naturally occurring. And the nice thing is, Cam, you use the dynamic friction whenever we're keeping the object moving. So hence why the question says to get a block moving, that means it's not moving and now we're making it move. So that's the initial push to move the object, and it's static. And then you have the dynamic, which is once you get the object moving, keeping it moving. Now, I'm sure a lot of you guys have already experienced this, which is how many of you guys have ever tried to move like a really big like couch, uh, table, bookshelf, something where you were just trying to nudge it, like just maybe a, a little bit, like half an inch, and you would push on it, push on it, and then as soon as you got it moving, you would overshoot where you were trying to get it to. Because once you overcome that static friction, it's easy to keep the object moving relative to the force you had to produce before,
because now you just have to overcome the dynamic friction. And if you guys haven't experienced it, then by all means, go try to move a heavy object in your home um, that isn't a person. Like you should always ask for consent before you try to start dragging your roommates and otherwise. But, you know, stuff happens. Actually, that would be kind of a funny, it could be a fun math problem. You guys want to do kind of a, a dumb, but we'll call it kind of entertaining. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll call it kind of entertaining math problem for you guys. You know, Luke, that is fair, but I'd rather still not have to go to the courts. So, all right, here's your math problem for you guys. Don't get me wrong, we're living in a pandemic, so I don't want any of you guys to do this anytime soon. However, I can definitely tell you from my own personal experience when I was your age, and I imagine some of you guys have had the same experience. How many of you guys have had a friend that maybe had one too many, and you had to carry slash drag them home? You guys can throw that up in the poll. Okay, so, oh, nice, nice. So yes, a number of us have had to live that wonderful experience before. Now, here's what we're gonna go ahead and do. Let's say your friend happened to have a little too much to drink, okay? We're gonna do a couple fun things with it. So ballpark the body weight of your best friend, okay? And we're going to, say for the example that, okay, I mean, there you go, there you go. Remember we're doing this in kilograms, that's what it's in pounds. So back in the day, uh, the friend that this literally happened to weighed about 100 kilograms. So in order to get his body mass, you need to go ahead and multiply that by gravity, which is gonna be giving them effectively the acceleration. So, that would be the individual's force. So in this example, my friend was 981 newtons. Now your friend has had too much to drink and is not able to walk anymore and they're being a little belligerent. So you decide to drag them across the parking lot, allegedly. Now this parking lot is a grand total of, we'll say it's 50, meters across. So if you take that 50 meters multiplied by that 981 newtons, what we have now is the amount of work because work equals our force times our distance. So that's how much work you would have performed dragging your friend across the parking lot. Now, or that'd be actually sorry, picking them up and effectively carrying them. Now, if we're dragging them across the parking lot, we're going to be doing this relative to the coefficient of friction. So, if the parking lot happens to be asphalt, and let's say it's, you know, jeans and a t-shirt going across asphalt, which I don't know if they'd still be your friend after you drag them across, we can figure out what that coefficient of friction would be. In fact, let's go ahead and use the power of good old Dr. Google. So here, what we have is different things and what's going across it. Uh, 
Turns out there is a not a good number for skin. That's too bad. Hmm. Actually, it's kind of interesting. I don't know if you guys can see it too well. Coefficient of friction between a tire when it's dry and the road is usually one, but a tire when it's wet is 0.2, which I guess that makes sense in this example why it's so easy for you to slide when you're on certain uh, surfaces. And we'll say they're on a wood skid. That'll make it a little bit easier for us. So wood, and concrete is going to be 0.62. So you effectively would be multiplying all that out by effectively 981 times 0.62, and that would give you the total amount of force you need to drag your friend across concrete. Now, however, we go on up, and we figure that it's ice, and ice in wood is only going to be at 0 0.05. So it turns out it's a lot easier to drag somebody across an icy parking lot than it is going to be to try and drag them across a concrete parking lot, allegedly. I don't love math. Does that make sense to you guys? Now let's say you decide instead, another I was confused on was if a ball was thrown at a 40 degree angle at 15 meters per second and flies for two seconds, how far will it have gone horizontally slash vertically? Oh, cool, sounds good. Um, we're good here. And let's go ahead and let's do some projectile motion. Now, Remember, with our projectile motion, in the ways that I'm writing these problems up for you guys, horizontal is the easiest thing. Because horizontal is simply going to be x equals our initial velocity times time. Now, the y coordinate is going to be equal to our initial velocity times time plus, you know, or effectively minus that one half of the acceleration times time squared. And then plus our y sub zero, so kind of where we started at. Now, ball thrown at a 40 degree angle at 15 meters per second, which means the first thing we need to do is set up our axes, where we know this is 40 degrees, this is 15 meters per second. So what we're gonna have to do is take that sine of 40 degrees equals our opposite over 15, and that's going to give us our y velocity. And we have the cosine, which is going to give us the horizontal. Equals our opposite, or sorry, our adjacent, sorry, over 15. So through doing our algebra, what we're gonna do is, sorry, multiply each of these by 15. And since we're multiplying that by 15, we end up with 15 times the cosine of 40 equals our initial horizontal velocity and 15 times the sine of 40 equals our initial vertical velocity. So what do you guys come up with there?
And have any of you guys had a chance to figure out the, okay. 9.64, horizontal 11.49. definitely be in the realm of possibility. Anybody else coming up with any numbers? Oh, sweet. Awesome. Good. So if we've got our horizontal at 11.49, we've got 9.64. Okay. So in order to figure out how far it would have gone horizontally after two seconds, we simply have to put in that 11.49, multiply that by two. So it would have gone 22.98 meters. Okay, everybody still with me? So then it's the vertical one that gets a little bit more intense, obviously. So we've got 9.64 times two. Now this can be minus because gravity, remember, is pulling us down. So we have one half of negative 9.81 times times squared. So that's two to the second power, so that's gonna be four plus zero. So now we go through and we are going to go ahead and solve for each side of this equation. So did you guys come up with an answer of about negative 0.34 meters vertically? And that horizontal of 22.98. Awesome. What are the questions you guys want me to work through? Just the horizontal, okay, okay. So for the horizontal side, we start off again with that 15 meters per second and a 40 degree angle. And so we're looking for the horizontal. So if we have the hypotenuse here, this is gonna be the adjacent. So hence, the cosine of 40 equals the adjacent divided by 15. So once we multiply both sides by 15, we have 15 times the cosine of 40 equals 11.49. Then we're going to go ahead and take and we multiply that 11.49, the initial velocity, times the time it spent in this example, which is two seconds. So 11.49 times two equals 22.98 meters. Yeah, guys, it's repetition. It's repetition and practice. That's why you've got that study guide. I've got the practice homeworks online. You can take them as many times as you want. It doesn't work, hurt your grade, but allows you to see the problems and different approaches. Uh, some are going to be on force. Some are going to be on projectile motion. Some of them are going to be on momentum. Pretty much all of the physics you're going to see on the first exam and it's just an easy kind of a multi, multiple choice. So the nice thing is it kind of give you the answer, so to speak. You got to pick between a certain number of them and that should at least help you kind of work your way back and then you can maybe see where your errors were. 
of why you ended up with one answer and it should have been another. But it's not gonna hold your hand, it's there to make you guys work. Hmm. Are there any other questions you guys wanna go ahead and review today? Now, one thing that we left off with last week that I've yet to hear anyone bring up, which is the number of uh, preschoolers it would take to stop you if you were running at full speed. Did you, who was able to figure out the answer to that question? No, 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 we, we are not running this as a real life experiment. I do appreciate your enthusiasm for science, Luke. However, I do not like going to meetings, especially those type of meetings. Hmm. Guys, if you're not able to think of some other things than what your homework, aside from obviously staying on top of your quizzes, making sure you guys are going through and getting your lab done on Thursday morning. I want you guys to try that study guide and the questions that you hit that wall with, you're like, I, I don't know how to set it up. I'm not sure if my answer was correct, anything along those lines, then that's what we're gonna go ahead and talk about and make that be the entire day effectively on Thursday of still helping you guys review for the exam and work your way through problems. So, does that sound good to you guys? Awesome. So we're gonna keep helping you guys review. Take care of yourselves, guys, and I will see you guys on, oh, can I go over the superhero assignment? Yeah, yeah, oh man, this is, okay, we'll, we'll leave it on this note, but let me go ahead and pull up the actual assignment text, because you only have to do the first half of it, because we're going to get into the rotational physics a little bit later on, and hopefully my links still work on that, because if they don't, then this is going to be a great time for me to feel like a jerk and realize that I need to go ahead and fix what I'm doing. All right. So, the first thing we're gonna go ahead and do, guys, is like anything else, we need to make sure we're setting things up correctly. So, the first question that I wanna go ahead and talk on, which is the whole jumping one. So, which is, you're gonna go ahead and obviously look at, effectively, how high did the Incredible Hulk jump? Now this is the Marvel Universe, which means it's set supposedly on Earth, and this specifically is in New York City. So you're to estimate how many stories up you jumped. Now, remember guys, in order to jump up that high off the ground, okay, in order to figure out that height, remember kinetic energy, bottom of the jump, 
So that's one half of the mass of the Hulk multiplied by the velocity squared equals the potential energy, so the very top of the jump. So that's gonna be mass of the Hulk multiplied gravity, 9.81 since we're still on Earth, and then the height, so how high he went up there. Now, how quickly did he accelerate to the speed is literally going to be from the very bottom of the dip of his jump to the point of which he hits triple extension. So that's gonna be how quickly he moves from the lowest position to the position where he's about to leave the ground. So he goes from the speed of zero to his, that peak speed of takeoff. And how much force he would put into the ground, well, that equals the mass of the Hulk multiplied by the acceleration that he put his body through that you guys just found out. And that is gonna be the Newtons of force into the concrete. And then you've got to do with the powers of the Googles, figure out what is the actual amount of force that concrete can withstand before breaking? And specifically, or asphalt, whatever surface you choose that he's gonna be jumping off of. So let's go ahead and watch the clip together now. And so, if we go, uh, first we watch him punch something. Now that would be fun because this could be a frictional problem of looking at how much would have to be the coefficient of friction of the asphalt between him and whatever the heck that thing. Okay, so here we go. I'm gonna slow this part down because that's gonna give you guys more context on what we're trying to look at here. So if I hit play, Yeah, probably slowed it down a little. Okay, so now, bottom of the jump right there. Okay, so that's the dip. Accelerate, so that's where he would have left the ground. So you'd figure out how many frames or how much time that took and you time it, okay? So that's gonna be that zero speed to the peak speed where he's left off the ground. Now, he's gonna sail through the air and if you look up, we're going to then estimate how many stories up that building it would be to get to the top of that jump. And that would be where his potential energy would equal what his initial kinetic energy would be. And so you're going to be able to figure out that takeoff velocity. If you know the takeoff velocity and you know the time it took to go from the bottom of that jump to the top of the jump, you have the acceleration because you have a velocity of zero and then that final velocity. And we know the mass of the Hulk, which is something you can use the power of the Googles. Usually it puts it about 400 to 500 kilograms, depending on the Marvel reference. Yes, I've looked this up more than once. And from there, you're going to be able to extrapolate how much force has been put into the ground when you know the mass of the Hulk. And you can add in gravity if you want, because obviously I had to overcome that too. And then figure out, okay, would the ground have survived? And that's how you solve the first problem. We'll talk about more of those soon enough. So stay safe out there, guys. And I will see you guys on Thursday. Come with your review questions. And we'll talk more then.